Hello and welcome to today's webinar. On behalf of Eurotransport and Lilly Systems, I'd like to thank you all for attending. I'm your moderator, Craig Waters, editor of Eurotransport magazine. Today's participants are Jessica Sweeney, Senior Director of Market and Product Strategy at Lilly Systems, and James Millor, Head of Commercial for Arriva's UK Bus North West England and Wales region. Following their discussion, we will move on to a live Q&A session where you can pose questions to our participants. You can submit questions at any point using the Ask a Question panel situated on the left-hand side of your screen. So without hesitation, let me pass over to Jessica Sweeney. Thanks very much, and uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening to those of you joining us from around the world. Uh, we wish to offer salutant, bonjour, buenos dias, chrudach, ahoy, hi, and hello uh, from James and myself. And because I would be embarrassing myself in any language other than English, that's it for the multilingual bit. Um, <laughs> James, why don't you introduce yourself to start, and then I'll follow. <laughs> I'll stick to English as well. Thanks, Jessica. Um, yeah, Arriva, just, just briefly, for those who don't know, Arriva um, is owned by Deutsche Bahn. It's one of the largest providers of passenger transport in Europe, currently in 14 European countries, um, employing around 60,000 people. There's over 2 billion passenger journeys taken on Arriva, um, buses, trains, trams, etc. each year. Um, my... My role is for the for the northwest um, of England and, and Wales bus business. It's had a commercial, so um, everything from dealing with planning of networks, um, fare strategies, commercial strategy, um, dealing with stakeholders. Um, so it's it's quite a quite a varied role, and and really looking at the the strategy of where we think that our bus, bus services are going uh, in the future. Okay, over over to you, Jessica, for your introduction. I think. Thanks very much. So I'm with Lely Systems, and we are a, a hardware, software, and services company headquartered in Silicon Valley in California. And uh, we've got offices in Amsterdam, our European headquarters there, as well as in Taipei for our Asia-Pacific region. And we have been focusing on uh, wireless connectivity solutions for the transportation market. We've got quite a... Um, few reference customers in rail. We'll be talking today about some of our customers in the busing industry. And we're interested in really understanding how we can help our customers achieve the uh, operational excellence that they're trying to achieve. And that's going to be the focus of our discussion today. So we've prepared a bit of an agenda just to give everybody a chance to understand what James and I are thinking about what we're going to be talking about, give you a chance to queue up some of your questions. Uh, so we thought that we'd start by looking at passenger priorities, because in the end, our goal is to um, get passengers using services, and so understanding what is needed to increase ridership and passenger satisfaction is at the top of the queue and the top of the agenda for our discussion. We'd also like to dive into what are the challenges and the opportunities for the operators. Why is it difficult? What are some of the uh, things that we've seen for the people trying to uh, meet those priorities? Now, we've promised to talk about the Internet of Things. We'll start by defining it, and we'll talk about how technology can be applied in some innovative ways to help to meet those challenges and to satisfy passenger priorities. We'll be focusing in on passenger Wi-Fi. It's a hot topic. We've got, we think, an interesting view on it, and we'll dig into that a bit. And we'll look at some of the underlying technology in more detail, uh, particularly around the onboard gateway and how we can optimize the value there. I've promised a use case. We always like good examples. James brings a tremendous amount of expertise. We'll share some uh, examples of what people are doing in the market today. And we'll finish up by talking about What's next? We'd really like for you all to walk away with actionable steps that you can take to get some of the value and to apply these ideas in your own environments. As we go, absolutely type the questions in, and James and I will do our best to cover them as we go and uh, at the end. James, you brought to our attention this uh, survey that was done by Transport Focus. 
uh, which is yeah. a publicly available survey. So well, tell us about it. It is. It's it's one that's been done for a few years now, previously called Passenger Focus, and um, it's it's one of the largest surveys purely focusing on bus passengers um, throughout the UK. And the purpose of it really is to try and understand how um, how bus services are performing in the eyes of the customers who are actually using them, and it's broken down into various different regions. It's also subdivided into some of the big sort of PLC or big sort of group operators, um, and it tries to sort of track how things are performing year on year and try and focus the mind um, of operators on on what can be done to continue to try and improve passenger satisfaction, um, and of course. We, you mentioned uh, mentioned briefly in the introduction things like Wi-Fi and so on, but the results that we've been looking at, um, and I, I focus in particularly in the regions where um, we are in the northwest northwest of England and Wales, although the results are broadly the same across across the UK, that people's main um, priorities, the customers' main priorities, are that the bus turns up on time. It turns up in the first place at all that the bus actually is punctual, so they can rely on on the service. It's all sort of really basic stuff, and then beneath that sits value for money, and then below that there are, there are various other factors then that, that passengers um, have as nice to have, but aren't the the real core um, things that they think are important. So there's all kinds of things, you know, like the cleanliness of the bus, the friendliness of the driver, the information provided, personal security, smoothness of the journey, etc. All those things are really important and all those things should be focused on. But the real sort of crucial things that are coming through in these results, um, time after time and sort of year after year, that we take away are um, punctuality and reliability of service, that buses are turning up on time, um, when they say they will, which is which is a real challenge in a number of areas for operators to deliver. Um, and so I think whilst there's a lot of um, a lot of debate over all the all, all the additional things that we can add to add to vehicles to improve the passenger experience, and of course Wi-Fi, you know, improved seating quality, USB charging for mobile phones, and things is becoming quite a big thing now as well. Whilst all those are helping to um, drive some growth and to differentiate uh, perhaps the bus uh, to, to you know, that it's that it's improving for passengers. It's one of those things where we shouldn't forget the basics either. So, you know, putting Wi-Fi on the bus, great, but it's not going to be. It's nowhere near as important as as, as, as the as the <laughs> basics, <laughs> if you like. So, so, so you I think that, that's the key learning from this. Really, that I, I would stress. You can't use the Wi-Fi if the bus hasn't turned up. <laughs> Is that the exactly. Idea? Exactly. So, so yes. James, then do you do you see that stakeholders are distracted by bells and whistles, or um, how is this passenger priority being actually made operational in the way that people are thinking about their services? I think. I mean, I think people can get um, can get distracted to some degree, but I, I think the key thing is let's assume okay the bus has turned up we, we've won half the battle the, you know the bus has turned up the person's on the bus I think um, having those additional things on the bus can then be important for people depending on depends on the length of journey um, it depends on their own personal views you know if Wi-Fi if, if they've got 4G um, LTE sort of signals on their phone and you know it's really fast and they're in an urban area where there's good signal and they're on a relatively short journey then they're not going to get distracted by the fact we've got free Wi-Fi they're just going to carry on <laughs> using the phone as normal <laughs> right. it's easier um, whereas um, some customers will specifically may have swapped from um, using another mode of transport uh, to using the bus because they've got those facilities, so it's difficult to it's difficult to really understand exactly why people are um, are, are using are using the bus um, broken down into you know whether whether the fact we've added Wi-Fi has actually done <laughs> has, has generated um, new patronage or not. So I think I think really my learnings from that are um, they're nice to have, but it's really difficult to quantify what the effects are on patronage overall so yeah. far. And, and for the operational challenges 
Arriva obviously get very high marks for passenger satisfaction, but it's an ongoing challenge to, to make sure that that service is maximally reliable um, for the riders. How big is the gap, would you say, overall across the industry? Um, how much more is needed to take everybody to that next level in your experience? I think there's, there's still quite a large gap and again it can vary by region because the the barriers to providing a, an efficient service um, or a punctual service um, are quite often outside the bus operator's control um, and in many cases rest within whoever whoever's the local transport authority um, in terms of control of, of, of roadworks for example is, is a major thing general congestion uh, and bus priority um, it's, it's a big issue and some areas are, are, are better at that than others. Um, so I think the gap is different depending on the, you know, in, even individual cities or towns in the region, but the gap is there's still a big gap. And whilst we're improving, certainly from our internal statistics, we're imp we have improved punctuality um, over the last year, it's still nowhere near where, where we want it to be. Ultimately, we want it to be at 100%. We know that's, that's probably not ever going to be achieved, but the closer we get to that, the better, but we're still some way off. So, right. yeah. And I think we could expect that in the cases where there are things outside the operator's control, that real-time communication and expectation setting with passengers goes a long way towards mitigating those effects. It does. It does. Um, it's it's a real help where if a, if a customer can find information on when the bus is going to arrive, and obviously that's a, that's a big help. And if you know if, if they're stood at a bus stop, no idea when a bus is coming, it's not turned up on time. If they know it's going to be there in a few minutes because the app's saying it's going to be there in a few minutes, then that gives them some confidence. If they don't know, then it's it's quite often a case of well, do they carry on waiting? Do they find an alternative uh, method of travel? So. Yeah, I, I think that's that's a huge help, and that's that's a, a sort of a growing part of the business. So, James, we have a survey for the participants on this uh, broadcast. I think we wanted to be sure we, we haven't put anybody to sleep now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, there should be a survey coming up on your screen, and uh, if you take a minute, it will just be there for a, a short time. Let us know which service do you think offers the greatest appeal to your riders. <coughs> We've put some selections up there. On-time arrivals, onboard passenger Wi-Fi, streamlined ticketing, onboard infotainment, or something else entirely. And uh, based on surveys that you've done, based on um, what you know about your riders in your market, where are the services that you think have the greatest appeal and where you're making those investments? So I'll give you just another uh, little bit to answer. The results are coming in. We'll have that pop up on your screen so we can all see it when, it's, uh, when everybody's had a chance to answer. It's also our opportunity to have everybody come running back to their computer and uh, click a button just to uh, keep the screen alive. So James, looking at the results as they come in, we get a preview of them before the, uh, the audience can see them. It looks like more than 70% of the folks listening to us um, agree with you, that uh, agree with you, agree with the results of the, uh, the Transport Focus Survey. Yeah, which is, uh, I guess it's comforting to know that we're, you know, it's, it's those survey results do actually mean something and do sort of reflect and I reflect but, what people are thinking. But we also do see onboard passenger Wi-Fi as, uh, as our second uh, leading uh, answer for the service that offers the greatest appeal. Yes, yeah. And that's not a surprise. That is the, the area of focus that we've seen. So let's talk about that a bit more so we can show those results to the audience and uh, everybody can uh, see what we're seeing. And as we think about how to meet those passenger priorities, um, we're looking at the challenges and the opportunities. So ultimately, we come back to the shared goal is to get commuters out of their cars. And this is both 
the um, reducing CO2, the corporate responsibility, the social responsibility aspect of it, of course, we're all thinking environmentally. We want to optimize our services and, uh, and optimize transport in our regions. But we also have organizational goals, and those organizational goals might be competitive ones. Uh, they might be set by the local authority. Uh, they might be financial ones about the efficiency of our service or the profitability of our service. And James, in the UK market that I know you're most familiar with, there's quite a lot of variation against the regulated versus the deregulated markets. Yes, there is. I mean, it, um, the regulated market, um, principally in London, um, where obviously Transport for London, uh, anyone listening in the UK, no, Transport for London is... is um, effectively in charge of public transport provision in London, and it's um, London quite often gets cited as the, um, the sort of goal for everyone else in the in the regions, the, the rest of the UK to um, to aspire to. And of course, London's got its own unique set of um, unique set of challenges and circumstances as well, where public transport has far far greater usage, um, particularly through through necessity and the difficulty of using the private car and so on. Um, outside of London in the deregulated market, um, as many people will, will know, things have, have, have grown up in a far more sort of fragmented fashion. And um, it's at the moment, there have been a number of um, developments over recent times, um, particularly in, in the bus market, where the, some parts of the UK have, have tried to re-regulate um, bus services and bring in bus franchising, which was tried in the northeast of England, which wasn't, wasn't successfully pushed through. But the new buses bill that's recently gone through Parliament is, is, is making that more a more realistic um, goal for, for many local authorities where they feel the deregulated market is not currently working for, for them. Um, so it's quite a different picture depending on which part of um, the UK that you're in and there's a number of challenges as, as commercial operators obviously the majority of our services are provided commercially so they live and die by, by the, the, the fares that are taken either on the bus or, or through other channels and so we've got to maintain and try and drive that revenue to, to, to have a business going forward um, and there's so many challenges within that you know we mentioned congestion and ensuring services are reliable but also um, having technology on vehicles to ensure that we are competitive with the private car or, or new technology that's coming along that's disrupting things like uber gets mentioned quite a bit yeah. and, and speaking of uber we did want to share this study uh, another study and just for the folks who are on the line we will make these links available to you to download some so you can read them in detail um, but this is a study that was done by APTA, the American Public Transit Association, and they did an examination of shared mobility uh, for mobility management, looking at ridership trends and integration with services like Uber and the other uh, disruptors and on-demand services. One of the really interesting and I'll say heartening findings is that they found that riders who used those services were more likely to use public transit as well. They owned fewer cars, and they spent less on transportation overall. So there's good news. Uh, when we look at competition, this innovation can be very disruptive, but it can also solve some of the problems that uh, operators are struggling with, like that first mile and last mile connection. Uh, and so we see where technology has the opportunity to be both a challenge and an opportunity there for us. Yeah, absolutely. And it's one of those things where um, commercial, particularly commercial bus operators in the UK are, are waking up to these technology opportunities, stroke threats, depending on, on, on which way they may look at them um, <laughs> increasingly now. And, you know, there may be opportunities within that to improve our own um, technology offerings to customers um, to improve particularly that first and last mile of the journey, yeah. um, which as you say is one of the most sort of challenging bits for us to, to, to get right. So let's dig into that in a bit more detail. Um, so as we look at the um, technology, I mentioned that one of the, the buzzwords that comes up is the Internet of Things. And it's easy to dismiss this as a, 
as a buzzword, as a sort of meaningless label that uh, people apply to all sorts of things. But I think it's really relevant to the challenges that we're talking about because the Internet of Things is ultimately about connecting together these different systems with machine-to-machine -machine communication taking advantage of all the data that we generate in our operations and our services, and using them to address problems and improve efficiencies. So if we think of um, IoT and machine-to-machine -machine communication simply as a way of getting us more insight, getting us more intelligence about the operation, we can see how we can apply that then to our connected transportation systems. So uh, one of the questions that has come through, we're sort of monitoring them as they come, is you know, what else might be installed onto a bus or a coach um, besides Wi-Fi or USB chargers, some of the things we've mentioned in passing. And we wanted to give a lot of examples here. Uh, James and I have a, a really long list of things we're aware of, some of which Areva are thinking about, some of which they've done, uh, some of which we've seen at Lily with our customers. And uh, this diagram is just meant to illustrate uh, a, a tiny spectrum of the possibility. So we've got things like onboard displays for both arrival information as well as for marketing information. We see passenger counting for uh, service optimization so we know much more about our riders, when they're getting on, when they're getting off, where we see our, our uh, biggest congestion in terms of passengers on board. We've got ticketing systems. We've got uh, surveillance cameras, which can be used both for passenger security as well as for collision avoidance systems. So speaking of uh, keeping the, the buses running, uh, we've got uh, the ability now to use technology to actually keep them in the center of the road. And lots of these apply both to coaches uh, and to rail. So we're focusing quite a lot on busing in this discussion, but I think it's worth noting that most of these systems have um, either equivalents or they're exactly the same in the rail systems as well. So uh, James, tell us a bit about some of the, uh, the examples of the systems in use at Arriva. You've got experience with several of these. Yeah, I'll just um, just going from the slide there. I'll just go through a few that we've got on there. Um, passenger Wi-Fi, obviously, we've mentioned, and probably the only other thing that we can add to that is um, at the moment that currently we we use the three G networks for that. Um, there's an argument that says we should be using four G to improve the the quality of experience for customers, and that's something that's that's been looked at, but it's at an early stage yet. Um, and there's also arguments that say, should we be using the Wi-Fi to assist in targeting sort of marketing messages and things at customers, as well as using it for the traditional customers logging on and, and, and looking at websites and so on. So passenger Wi-Fi is in use. And it, again, it's not in use in all vehicles. It's in an increasing number of vehicles, but it's it's been focused in sort of busier areas initially. But I think we, we see passenger Wi-Fi being on all um, vehicles ultimately, but that's still a couple of years off maybe. We don't have infotainment or, or, or anything like that at the moment. Um, the other big one that we have really looking at, looking at the slide is the mobile, the CCTV. All vehicles are fitted with full CCTV systems that monitor the inside and outside of the vehicle, which is used for both security um, for customers and staff, um, comes in very useful monitoring accidents and so on for the road users, and that also records audio in many cases as well. So um, there's increasing use of that um, throughout the business. And ticketing and validation, we 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 have the traditional traditional ticket machine systems that, that most bus operators use, um, particularly in the UK, which is your ticket, ticket issuing systems. However, we are trying to um, shift people onto different channels, um, either through M ticketing on the mobile phones or internet purchases to try and move some of the um, move some of the transactions away from bus and hopefully speed journeys up, which comes back to helping with. Um, on bus sort of journey time and punctuality. And one of the other big things we're currently looking at and are due to roll out in our northeast business in January next year is um, contactless EMV uh, electronic payments using contactless um, debit and credit cards on vehicles to pay for journeys in that way. And ultimately that may lead to capping of 
capping of journeys and similar sort of principle that you have in London with the with, um, with their system. So I think they're the key ones um, from the technologies on your slide there, Jessica, that we we use at the moment. But there's still some, obviously, still some way to go because we don't have onboard diagnostics or say the infotainment, etc. That, that I know some particular rail services have. So as we think about those different systems, um, we can we can divide them into different categories. So one of them might be the ones that are real time versus mm -hmm. the ones that are done in batch. So we typically see a surveillance camera that does onboard storage, and then when the bus pulls in. Uh, or when an incident happens, it can be downloaded uh, typically manually, sometimes over a Wi-Fi connection. Um, so we've got an example there of a batch uh, kind of communication where it's not in real time. And we see this also with the ticket machines. Is that right, that you've, you're doing that wireless communication in the garage overnight? Yes. All ticket machines at the moment are wirelessly, they wirelessly download transactional data to the, to the garages overnight and similarly any um, updated data that needs to go to the ticket machines is done um, the opposite way from the garage to the vehicles um, when they're in the garage overnight. So that's, um, that's saved a considerable amount of time and resource in terms of, of um, up, updating and downloading data. Yeah. Then we've got examples of real-time systems, um, both at Arriva and at operators around the world. Of course, passenger Wi-Fi we keep coming back to is the ultimate real-time system, but we've also got uh, arrival and GPS information uh, that can be provided in real-time to uh, help riders understand, as you uh, explained in the example before, when is that bus coming, if it is delayed mm -hmm. or if it is on time. Uh, and we've also got another way of thinking about the different systems on board, these connected systems for transportation, in terms of who's consuming the information. So we've got some uh, systems that are for internal use and some systems that are actually shared external to the organization. So we're seeing quite a lot of app developers and information services that are able to use bus information and share that out to riders through a third-party platform. Yes, and, and at the moment, um, there's, there's limited, um, particularly from our point of view, there's, there's a limited number of um, external uh, parties that we share that information with, um, normally local authorities or passenger transport executives in the big metropolitan areas where we can share real-time information feeds from our ticket machines, which can then be translated to real-time stop information or their own apps. And of course, it's shared with all of our vehicles and share that information with our own systems so that our own app is updated with, with where all our vehicles are. It's one of the provisions of the new um, buses bill legislation here that um, they want that kind of information to be made publicly available uh, from commercial organizations so that anyone will be able, as you say, be able to, to, to build an app, take a standard feed effectively and to build an app uh, and come up with all kinds of uh, all kinds of ways to display that information as we know people are really imaginative with apps. So, um, you know, there's things that we've perhaps not thought of yet that someone will think of when they get, <laughs> get the opportunity to use that information. <laughs> Excellent. So, so clearly an array of applications um, for anyone on the line who's thinking about their own operations and thinking, ah, I haven't got to half of these <laughs> or I'm not ready for what comes next. Um, you know, we know that there are a huge number of things that can be done for streamlined operations, improved security, revenue generating services, but we also know that no transport operator has the same <clears throat> goals uh, outcomes that they're looking for. They certainly don't all have the same customers or routes or environment that they're operating in. So we know that every situation is unique and that uh, it, typically what we see across the industry is that you start somewhere. So you start with one kind of service that will give the best return on the investment or that meets the most urgent um, priority. Now, in a lot of cases, it starts with passenger Wi-Fi, and that sometimes comes from the authorities who think it's, uh, it's really cool, um, and sometimes it comes from a need for competitive differentiation across uh, the other uh, transport options in the market where you're operating. Um, and Ariva's done uh, passenger Wi-Fi, 
Uh, and uh, James, one of the things you mentioned to me when, when we were talking earlier was that it's really difficult to quantify the effect of that, to, to look at the, the benefit that it's had. It is. Um, I mean, we, we've done passenger Wi-Fi um, in a few areas, and in particular um, Merseyside, uh, Liverpool area is a big area where we've done passenger Wi-Fi, and there's a few reasons for that really. There's been an alliance with Mersey Travel, the local passenger transport executive, where um, we've committed to rolling out Wi-Fi to all vehicles, but also there's, there's competitive elements as well, where other large operators in the area have Wi-Fi on some or all of their buses, so you mentioned the sort of competitive differentiation. Uh, in our case, in some cases, it's a case of matching the, co the competition because um, we need to be at least at the same standards as them so that we don't lose out overall. So, um, yeah, we, we've, we've put Wi-Fi on a lot of vehicles, and, and it is difficult to quantify the effects because the way that we've done it has generally been um, done in such a way that it's either been combined with um, newer vehicle, new vehicles or refurbished vehicles or something else that's happened at the same time, be that fares or service levels. So it's been, whilst we have generally seen growth in those things that we've, we've done, it's really difficult to quantify, well, was, what percentage of that growth was purely down to Wi-Fi or, or, or any of the other measures that was taken. What we do know is that where we've put Wi-Fi in, we've seen usage start from obviously a zero base and had relatively slow growth at the start, but has really taken off over the last, particularly over the last sort of 12 months really, that we've seen a big step up in the use of Wi-Fi. But what we don't really understand is if we switched all that Wi-Fi off tomorrow, will that affect our customer base and patronage, will people stop using the bus, will they just be unhappy because it's not there or, or, or not, so that, I think that's the really difficult bit where we're not, we're not sure and there's still some sort of more work to be done on understanding that in more detail, I think. So one of the things that I promised at the beginning was to talk about a new approach to addressing some of these challenges. Um, because we've got all these different services. We've got Wi-Fi, which has some value, but we're not sure that it's enough to really drive um, investment in the technology. And one of the other uh, items I wanted to mention, too, is that as these independent systems pop up, uh, we sometimes end up with what I've heard called the hedgehog bus, where every new system comes in. It's got its own antennas. It's got its own communication system. Um, and, uh, and we end up with lots of onboard systems, each communicating independently, but not with each other. Yes, that's right. And um, we, um, we, I guess we're, we're, we're guilty of that. So I know many, many other sort of organisations. Uh, and as you said, that's that's just the way, really, um, a product of the way that things have grown up, and these technologies have come along. At, different points in time or different bus operators have embraced them at different points in time so um, you know that the ticket machine systems I'm guessing for most operators ticket machine systems are the ones that were installed first of all because that's what you need on the vehicle and um, to be able to charge fares which is kind of important and then <laughs> from that you know the GPS real-time information has come along and in some cases that's been a separate fitment in the vehicle or it's been an upgrade within the ticket machine or has involved a new ticket machine but it's still a separate part of that machine and, and um, feeds into separate back office systems um, and then as we've, we've mentioned several times the Wi-Fi that's come on board that's again as a completely separate system um, to the ticket machine to the GPS um, and again where, where some vehicles um, have got sort of smart reporting back on, on um, things like you know the, the engine management and so on. Again, that's a separate system. So these things have, have, have all sort of grown up over time. And in actual fact, in a lot of cases, there's, there's been no way of having them all integrated as a single, as a single combined system anyway, because the different suppliers um, all supply different technologies or don't have physically don't have equipment that combines them all into, into one, if you like. So, yeah, it, it's, it's, when you look back in hindsight, you think it's, it's really complicated the way it is, but it's, there's been a reason behind how that's developed. Going forward, if we had the chance to do it all again, we, we may all, as an industry, look at it in a different way, but 
um, we are where we are at the moment in time. All right. So as we look at the next generation, um, and I think we had talked about this as a um, next generation of passenger, uh, did we call it satisfaction, um, mm. we're thinking about how we evolve to uh, a more sophisticated, more integrated, and uh, more efficient platform. So what, uh, what Lily are, are looking at and what we've installed with our customers is an onboard communications gateway and platform which is intended to provide a mechanism for all those different onboard systems to be supported through one central communications gateway. So you've got that, uh, all those different applications on board feeding through standard interfaces, and you can bring them on one at a time. So it's not an all or nothing proposition. It's the same incremental approach that we see being very effective, adding services as you need them, as demand drives them, and uh, as the priorities dictate. So you can tailor the solution uh, to the actual challenge. And we see here we've got remote assets, onboard systems, sensors, passenger information, CCTV. It's just some examples of the different things on board that you'd want to plug into <clears throat> the communications platform. And what we recommend is that that all move through a single mobility tunnel so you can unify all of that, share those resources for communication, those LTE, Wi-Fi, and uh, uplinks that you've got across all of those different services. And then move that into the back office through the cloud so we're able to service both those uh, third-party external consumers of the information as well as all of our internal uh, dashboards and analytics and the internal reporting that we need to do. But when we move all of these uh, different services onto the single communications platform, we get the efficiency of scale, but we're also looking for the opportunity to really specify the priorities that are going to make our operations more efficient. So Lily are also introducing uh, the idea of the operations prioritized communications. So when you're thinking about the different ways that you can offload the information, you might have some 3G connections, you might have some LTE connections, you might have Wi-Fi when you pull into the station or the garage. And uh, one really easy example of operations prioritized communications might be the least cost routing. So imagine, James, when you're away from the station and you've got your um, – CCTV hooked up to this communications platform, <clears throat> you might want to have the real-time communication when you need it, on demand, in the event of a security incident. But our least cost routing is going to activate that Wi-Fi when you pull into the garage so you can offload your CT CCTV in the least cost method that's available to you as the operator. Yeah. Now, of course, what we also get with that is bandwidth permitting exceptional passenger connectivity. So with the uh, communications platform then, we've got the investment for all of the operational efficiencies that we want to introduce. And off the back of that, we can offer passenger Wi-Fi and uh, do some of the testing that you mentioned. Is it really going to, uh, to give us the best return on our investment? Is it going to give us the best customer satisfaction? Should we give them unlimited bandwidth, or should we actually restrict it so that it doesn't eat up all of our uh, LTE costs and have that go through the roof? So that kind of operations prioritized communication allows you to really set those priorities in the platform, tie them into the different applications you've got on board, and uh, optimize the services that you're offering. Mm -hmm. I thought that we might talk about another example. We've got a case study, as I've promised, just so I'm not putting all the pressure on you, James, <laughs> in uh, what we're doing. We're going to look at another um, example here, and this is a Lily customer, We Drive You. And they're a commuter shuttle, so uh, they're also a uh, for-profit organization, but they're operating not for a local authority, but for leading technology companies here in Silicon Valley. And uh, we see this in several markets around the world where you've got employees who need to be bused into the corporate campus. 
Um, in this case, the focus is very much on productivity for the customer's uh, employees. And so we've got Lily's Connectivity as a Service uh, system with the Connectivity Gateway on board. We've got the virtual back end. We've got the live help desk and support services for the um, passengers. And we've seen um, initial results 100% passenger satisfaction with the service. The emphasis is very, very clear for this operator that passenger Wi-Fi is an extremely high value add. And we can quantify the actual results in terms of the, uh, the number of hours of additional productivity that the company gets from its employees as they ride this coach into work in the morning with the Wi-Fi connection that gives them uh, campus-like connectivity, just as though they're in the office. But we also see how that operations focus comes into play in this example because we're able to analyze the service, analyze the passenger behavior, and to get the best possible experience relative to the key operational need. So there's two companies we can contrast here. So there's one uh, operator, or sorry, there's one customer whose priority is to have as much bandwidth as possible, as seamless a transition from the campus Wi-Fi to the coach. So they've decided that their priority operationally is to offer unlimited um, connectivity to their passengers. We have another uh, customer for this operator who has a different priority. They're really thinking more about less um, all the different things that their employees might want to do on the shuttle. And they're thinking more about prioritizing for VPN connections and things that are very clearly identified as being work-related. So through the operations dashboard, we can implement those different priorities for the different routes, for the different kinds of passengers, for the different priorities that we've got, and make that part of the passenger experience and, um, and uh, the, uh, the communications on board. <clears throat> So this is an example here on the slide that I'm showing you of some of the analytics. So there's usage reporting and passenger analytics. Um, we've talked about how to do that in terms of bandwidth allocation, but we're also looking at the opportunity for understanding riders better. So those of you who are focusing on the customer experience, who are focusing on marketing innovation, there's really the opportunity to understand who's boarding the bus, how they're spending their time, while they're using your transport service. Uh, in one other case, uh, not with We Drive You, but another customer that we're working with, really the onboard services are all about the marketing opportunities to understand the passengers, to gather their details so that the operator can make a personal connection to them and to offer the value-added services that way. All right, just being cognizant of the time, um, I think we've had a good chat, James, and we want to get to some of the details of how we actually put that in place. So we've had some examples of what we can do, and uh, I thought we might focus then on actually how we do that. So I've mentioned that uh, one customer we drive you is using our service model. So we've got a monthly bundled all-in-one subscription with a fully managed solution so the operator really doesn't have to do any work. They don't have to be technical. Uh, it's uh, simply all done for them. But we've seen different challenges for uh, operators uh, in public transit. And James, there's, there's a different set of challenges there. Is that right? There are, yes. I mean, it's, it, it really depends on um, whether it's entirely kept within a commercial organization or whether it involves local authorities as well, because um, I'm sure anyone who, who's listening in from local authorities will know there's, there's been less challenge over finding 
money for capital projects so finding capital money is, is been has been traditionally easier than finding money for ongoing revenue streams so you can build something but then whether you can afford to maintain it afterwards is, <laughs> is another matter so um and and that's that's been sort of a traditional way that things have have, have generally been developed over the last few years where there's been quite significant capital investment put into buying equipment fitting equipment and systems and then um, further down the line um, there have been challenges in um, the revenue keeping <laughs> effectively finding revenue to keep those systems either maintained uh, or going in the longer term so in some cases those systems disappear uh, or in other cases they get downgraded or uh, so on so I think the, the capital model has been one that's been quite prevalent in the UK, um, but as I say, it has its, has its challenges in terms of keeping things going um, in the longer term. Yeah. So I'd like to take the opportunity just to mention um, the Lily products that are available for some of these challenges we've been discussing. So we've got the service model, which is the connectivity as a service, but we've also got for the capital model, the actual hardware that someone might want to purchase and install. And I think, James, to your point about the ongoing cost of maintenance, there's really two ways that we've seen we can approach this. And one is um, about uh, getting very high quality hardware, which has been proven to, to have high performance, high quality, last a long time. And we also see the opportunity to do that capital expense in multiple tiers or multiple tranches over time as, they, uh, as the funding becomes available. So, James, you had something to add? No, no. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> so I thought we could move then directly into the next steps um, for the folks who are on the line who are thinking, how do I make this real, and uh, we'll just put some ideas out there, and then I think we should move directly into the question and answer period. We've only got about 10 more minutes before the end of the hour, and we've got lots of questions we want to answer. Um, so the real idea here is just create a plan. Really examine the operations priorities, look at the traffic, understand what you're trying to achieve, and then think ahead. So look at how do you maximize the capital investment that you're making, how do you maximize uh, the benefit that you're getting and minimize those operational expenses on an ongoing basis. And then what are the next steps? So as I mentioned, we're going to provide um, links to the reports that we've talked about. We're going to provide a copy of the slides. There will be a recording available. And uh, we here at Lilly, uh, we've had uh, lots of success in the North American market. We're a trusted provider to the big rail companies and several of the bus companies here. But we're also relatively new to the European market, and we're looking for uh, some of you who are on the line thinking about doing that who'd like to partner with us for proof of concept. If you're a metro, a train, a tram, a bus operator, I know we've got some consultants on the line as well who are listening in who might have the opportunity to uh, work with Lily. We invite you to get in touch with us, and uh, we'd love to work with you on that proof of concept. So over to the questions, and uh, let's see which ones we've got here that we want to talk about. Okay, yeah, that's great. Thank you very much, um, both of you there, for your uh, discussion and comments. Thank you very much. So, yes, we can now move on to the Q&A session. Um, don't forget, um, anybody listening can still submit their questions using the Ask a Question panel um, situated on the left-hand side of the screen. So, let's just take a look at uh, the first question. Um, here we go. Is money better spent improving the customer experience through Wi-Fi connectivity than speeding up the journey? If yes, what must the Wi-Fi enable the passenger to do while traveling? Who has comments on that? Um, interesting question. I think first initial reaction to that is, um, I think I'm not saying, I know we've, we've may sound that we've been critical of Wi-Fi and the fact that you know it's not worth doing. We're not saying that at all. I think speeding up the journey 
and making the journey reliable is probably a greater priority. Um, but I think if we're going to have Wi-Fi, then we should ensure that it's a good experience for the customer. So I think that's the way I prioritise the two. Excellent, thank you. Any comment from your side, Jessica? Couldn't agree more. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent, thank you. Okay, next question. Um, in the case where users have or do have access to free Wi-Fi, does having an unreliable and slow connection damage customer satisfaction as much as not having connectivity at all? I'd um, certainly say it does. James, in our experience, um, we've seen quite a few people who've put in a low, uh, a low end Wi-Fi solution just so that they could tick the box, so that they could say they have Wi-Fi. And when passengers then who were very interested in riding the service because of the Wi-Fi had that negative experience, they then didn't have the opportunity to have those passengers back. So um, in my experience, we've been contacted by lots of operators who've got something in place that isn't meeting customer expectations, and now they are looking for that next generation system. Yeah, that, I agree. I think, I think it's, a, it's one of those classic cases where if we can't do it right and it's not a good experience, it's better not to have it at all than to have something that's really frustrating for people because they just lose confidence in the system. Great. Thank you very much, both of you. Um, next question. Is customer satisfaction an acceptable metric to measure return on investment to, Im to improve this type of technology or to improve these types of technology projects um, within bus companies? So installation of Wi-Fi for end users on boards? Who has comments on that? Um, I guess from, from our side, um, I think th w the way we would look at it is does it generate um, does it generate additional customer patronage and therefore revenue? Um, and again, the challenge is over identifying exactly what the Wi-Fi generates. So I think um, in terms of a metric, we'd be looking at ultimately generation of passengers and therefore revenue. Um, but in theory, increased customer satisfaction um, should lead to hopefully existing users using the service more and hopefully to attract new users. So the, the two aren't mutually exclusive, but I would say from, from our point of view, certainly it's a more of a focus on the, on the numbers more than anything else. And James, I'm just going to follow up on that audience question. Is that really down to the internal um, capital expense approval process? Yes. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Jessica, I think this um, one is for you. Um, do your systems only provide a communications platform, or do they provide the applications as well? And do your systems use open standards so that other suppliers' um, applications can be added? What are your thoughts on that? Um, thanks for that question. So it's good to clarify. We've really approached this with an open platform design. And so we recognize the appeal is in the applications, not the hardware. So the goal is to choose the hardware that optimizes the selected applications for that operator. Um, so it's, it is really a hybrid approach where we've got some of the um, applications integrated onto the platform. But by and large, what we want to do is allow the operators to use the applications that are already in place. And with our systems, we've got even an onboard application engine. So we're seeing some cases where we've got third-party software for passenger services or operational services that are actually running on the communications gateway. And we see other examples where the processing is done on the third-party hardware. And that's quite often done on, for example, CCTV systems where they're doing some image processing. And then that's passed through the communications gateway. So I'd say that the goal here is really to have the open standards, to have the uh, open platform, and then to allow people to bring those applications onto the gateway system, either with their existing uh, or on an uh, as-needed basis as the operations priorities dictate. Fantastic. Thank you. There's another question here for you, Jessica. Um, does Lily offer pilot programs um, for testing technology? Um, if so, what is the criteria to qualify for a trial? 
So we believe that a pilot program is really the best way to understand how this will work in your environment. Um, I think you've got the idea from our conversation, James and myself, that there's a huge amount of variability. So what we want to do is tailor the solution to the actual challenge. And what we'd like to do is invite everybody listening to present us your unique challenge so that we can work together with you to discover the best solution. Um, quite a lot of these application integrations are very specific to the environment in which they're running. The connectivity challenges are very specific to the environment in which you're, uh, you're running your routes. And so the best way to approach this type of project is to work together as partners. Um, I would say that uh, the best way to get started is to get in touch with us. And I put up my personal details there. Um, so if you're interested in, uh, in talking with me personally, we can have a longer conversation. And we've also got our team based out of Amsterdam who can connect with you directly. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, let's have a look at some more questions here. Does the system allow the allocation of different data streams to different communication streams? For instance, in a depot, could someone direct FAIR data to one Wi-Fi network while directing CC to another Wi-Fi network? Who has comments on that? Um, so it sounds like they might be asking specifically about the Lili system. Um, so we didn't get yeah, into sorry. a lot of technical detail, and I think I'm, we're very, very happy to. Um, I could probably go on a while about the technical <laughs> aspects of it, uh, the mobility tunnel and the um, high availability links and that sort of thing. So the short answer to the question is absolutely yes. Uh, and in fact, managing those different data streams is part of the key value of that operational, uh, operations prioritized communication. Um, so what we see is that um, that intelligent routing is one of the requirements both for efficiency and for security uh, and certainly to, to get the information where it needs to be. But I would invite the person who asked that question, let's get in touch and let's actually do a technical deep dive and, uh, and really dig into that, because I think that the technology behind it is actually really quite interesting. Um, but uh, James and I have been a bit more high level in our conversation today. Great, thank you. Um, a question here, I think, for both of you, um, probably. Um, regarding infotainment trends um, in buses and, and on trains, when it is offered, is it expected by the user um, to have a tablet on board, so similar to what we get in airplanes? Um, where they can control their own user experience as opposed to shared digital displays, perhaps? Any comments on that? James, um, is that something you've looked at at Ariva? It's not. No, I mean, uh, I think from, um, certainly from the bus perspective, um, it's not something we've looked at in terms of having t tablets available, for example, at each seat or something like that. We've more relied on the fact um, or more looking at the way that people would have their own devices, so they'll have their own sort of phones and so on, and then any infotainment um, that's maybe streamed from the vehicle or through our Wi-Fi would actually be delivered then to their own device initially. Um, don't know how that's going to develop in the future. I know that um, Virgin Trains, one of the um, main train operator in the UK, have recently done a similar thing where they've put uh, an onboard infotainment system onto their trains that streams a bit like sort of a mini Netflix set up, but you need your own device to look at that. It's delivered free through their Wi-Fi systems, but you need your own device. So I think that's the, the sort of initial start point on those kind of things. But maybe longer term, um, we, we, we'll get into the, you know, having fixed sort of tablet devices built into, into vehicles so people don't need to share. Cause I, I suspect the collective experience of looking at that people don't want. They want to look at what they want to look at when they want to look at it, such as the, the way technology is these days. And that does tie into another question um, very closely related, which is um, really about what are the trends and solutions um, that might be feasible. It is really boring to ride a bus for some of these very long commutes. And, and James, I think you've touched on the key thing, which is that it's going to be hugely variable. And uh, it's really going to be uh, about giving the passenger the specific experience that they want for whatever that route is. Um, so I think that's, for us, the key value of the platform approach that we've embraced is that future proofing for the big unknown that we don't know what might come in the future. That's right. 
That's right. And what, what, what we do know is that, you know, the way technology is developing, people people expect more and they expect to have what they want to watch and do available to to them personally when they want it. So it's 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 trying to meet that challenge on public transport systems. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, unfortunately, that is all we have time for today. Um, so please join me in thanking Jessica Sweeney and James Millor for their time today. Um, for those who didn't have their questions answered, all remaining questions will be answered shortly by email. And so on behalf of Eurotransport and Lily Systems, I'd like to thank you all for attending. As you exit, you will be asked to rate the webinar. So please do so as it will help um, make them even better in the future. Thanks again for your attention, and we look forward to having you attend other Eurotransport webinars soon. Thank you. Goodbye.